Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of the Descent. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Dean Buonomano. He is Professor of Neurobiology and Psychology at the University of California, Los Angeles. His research goal is to understand how responses to temporal features such as duration, interval, and order. He is the author of books like Brain Bugs and Your Brain is a Time Machine. So, Dr. Buonomano, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for having me, Ricardo. It's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, what is the best way of understanding time from the perspective of neuroscience? It's a bit of a tricky question because time means many things. So, it's certainly true that the brain can help us understand time, but to understand the brain, we need to understand how the brain tells time and processes time. Okay, I'll start that again. Let me turn this off. Uh, yeah, no, no, no problem, no problem. <clears throat> okay. So, yeah, that's a good question. It's certainly the case that to the brain might help us understand the nature of time, but in, in many ways it's more true that to understand the brain, we need to understand how the brain tells time, conceptualizes time, and processes time. So let me just give four examples why neuroscientists need to understand how the brain processes time and conceptualizes time. Because in many ways, the brain's main function is to predict the future, to store information about the past in order to predict the future. And that's what memories are for. Memories are not to allow us just to reminisce. Memories are future oriented in that they allow us to predict the future. Mm -hmm. Number two, the brain needs to tell time. So in order to predict the future, you need to be able to have some sort of timer in our brain, some sort of clock that allows us to tell the seconds, minutes, hours, and days. Third, and perhaps more interestingly, the brain allows us to engage in mental time travel, to imagine the future, to mm -hmm. revisit the past. And this is something very unique to human beings. And finally, more relevant to philosophy and maybe physics, the brain gives us this ability to feel the passage of time, the flow of time, the subjective feeling of the passage of time, which is a bit mysterious. And this has some tension with physics because some views in physics and philosophy are that time doesn't pass, that time is already, um, the past, present, future already exist in a sense, uh, in a manner of speaking. So, so to go back to your original question, it really depends on what we mean by time and what type of timing we're referring to. Mm -hmm. And uh, how does the brain process time? Because if I understand it correctly, I mean, there are several differences here. I mean, there's, uh, for example, the subjective experience of time. There's how the brain processes time. And uh, th th those are different from one another. And they are both different from how we, through different technological devices, keep track of time and also from the f physical nature of time is that, that yeah yeah that's that's exactly correct and it goes to the point that um yeah we have to be careful with what we're what we're um referring to when we say how the brain tells time so the question of how the brain processes time let's think about that in two ways one is just how it creates clocks how does it do timing um uh, pr uh tasks so and the answer is is the brain is very different from the physical clocks that we make. So we have these beautiful, incredibly sophisticated man-made clocks that we've made better and better throughout um, human civilization. Um, but the amazing thing about the clocks that we use um, on our wrists and on our computers is that they can tell time on the scale of microseconds, seconds, hours, days, and years. The brain can also tell time on those scales, but it has very, very different mechanisms to do so. So the brain has a way to tell time where you're processing the pause between my speech and music. And the brain, you know, the hours. You also, as you know, you have a circadian clock, 
that tells the time of day, the hours, that clock doesn't have any second hand. So the brain has very different mechanisms to tell time across different scales. So the brain has multiple clocks. This is what we can call the multiple clock principle. Now, in addition to telling time, we humans can conceptualize time. And that's very unique. And in many ways, that's what makes Homo sapiens sapien. That's one of the things that makes human beings wise is our ability to revisit the past and imagine the future. And that ability underlies most of human culture and human society, right? Because we we go to school in order to achieve something in the future. We plant seed, have food in the future. And those that simple idea of preparing for the future is something that, as far as we know, most animals um, evades the cognitive capacity of most animals. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. So, but uh, I mean, I would like to ask, is there uh, any, uh, are there any instances where there might be a correlation between how the brain keeps track of time, for example, when it comes to the circadian rhythm and uh, the way we ourselves keep track of of time through our technological devices? Because, for example, if I am used to going to bed at 11 p.m., then usually by around that time, I get sleepy and it's very hard for me, very easy for me to fall asleep. And the same, in the same way, if I wake up every day at uh, 6 a.m., it's very easy for me to wake up at that time. And all, also for other things like uh, feeling hunger and all of that, that more or less the same time every day. So uh, how does that happen exactly? So you have a circadian clock um, in a part of the brain. The main circadian clock is in a part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. That's part of the hypothalamus. But it's important to realize that most cells in your body have a circadian clock. They have an oscillator made of DNA and RNA and proteins that creates this loop that the DNA expresses RNA, which makes proteins, and the proteins inhibit the synthesis of more DNA. And that loop takes four hours. Now, all animals and all plants even have a circadian clock. So in many ways, you don't even need a brain for a circadian clock. But we use this circadian clock, as you said, for our daily rhythms, not only when you go to sleep and when you wake up, but when we eat. But it's important to know that it's preparing your physiology. The circadian clock is really a prediction device, right? It's not just telling you to wake up. It prepared your body to wake up before you woke up. So it changed the hormones levels. Now, this natural circadian clock, of course, in for primitive man, for early humans, was entrained by the sun Mm -hmm. um, and the changing light patterns and so forth. But today that interacts with our man-made clocks, which was um, one of the points you're making, is that even if we're tired, sometimes if we look at the clock and you say it's nine o'clock, you might say, well, I'm going to stay up because even though I'm tired, I want to go to bed at 11 o'clock. So now our circadian clock is entrained. Um, It's tuned not only by the sun and the temperature, but by our external clocks, which are much better. Remember, for early humans, the duration of the day was very, very different. The winter Mm -hmm. would um, come, uh, the day would be much shorter. So presumably humans would go to bed or sleep a bit earlier because their clocks were entrained by the sun. But that no longer happens. You tend to go to bed at 11, whether it's summer or or winter. So so there is this interaction between man-made clocks and our circadian clock. Mm -hmm. Uh, What factors influence how how our brains process time? So if by process time, we mean our subjective experience of the passage of time. So then um, many subjective factors. So in English, of course, we have these expressions, um, time flies when you're having fun or a watched pot never boils. Uh, 
and presumably I don't know those expressions in Portuguese, but um, but this shows that our external environment, our our context, our internal representation to the subject feeling of the passage of time. And most people have had that feeling, right? If you're very bored, if you're anxiously awaiting something important, if you know that um, an important somebody you know is in the hospital and you need to wait to hear from the doctor, time seems to go by very slowly as it's happening. And that's what we call prospective timing. This, by the way, a lot of people felt during the, the COVID pandemic, during the lockdown period where they were maybe home alone um, under social isolation, a lot of people reported that time seemed to be going slowly as it was happening. So that's prospective timing. But after the fact, maybe again during COVID at the end of the year, um, when people were beginning to have social interactions again, people looked back and said, wow, that went by very quickly. Mm-hmm. So there's a bit of a paradox here with what we call prospective timing and retrospective timing. Retrospective timing is really memory. It's how well you estimate the passage of time based on how many items you have in memory. So there's this very well-known phenomena that's sometimes called the vacation paradox that as you're doing something that's very engaging and entertaining and rich, it seems to go by quickly. But when you look back on it, it seems to have lasted a long time because you have a lot of items in memory. So retrospectively, it might have seemed to go by uh, uh, contained a long period of time. So absolutely, our our sense, our subjective sense of the passage of time is modulated by stress, um, cognitive engagement, um, social interactions, and of course, other things as well, like as psychopharmacology drugs of course have a, can have a profound effect on our subjective sense of time and so forth so there is a very strong interaction mm-hmm. but basically about duration uh, what about order uh, i mean, we subjectively experience uh, the order uh, of things uh, the order they happen can it change due to different yes. factors as well yeah <clears throat> So it depends on the scale we're talking about. So if you're listening to the words that are coming out of my mouth, most of the time you're not going to confuse the order Mm -hmm. um, because the order is critical. But as you probably know, if I give you a list of numbers or a list of things to memorize and give you eight words that you have to memorize, yes, then you might remember some of them out of order or you might be unaware of the order but that's more of a memory um, feature of memory and that when we store information we don't always store uh, the memory but there's can be cases in which we confuse the order and one of the examples is for example if i give you a sound just say the onset of a tone and a flash of light and those become closer and closer and closer together there's circumstances in which you can misidentify whether the light went on before the sound or the sound went on before the light. But it's not generally, um, we generally don't confuse order as much as we confuse duration. Uh, so, and uh, we've already mentioned here that there's a difference between neural time and subjective time, but what is the relationship there? I mean, what is the relationship between how the brain keeps track of time and our subjective experience of it? Yeah, this is a fascinating question, and we have our conscious perceptive perception of time and we can think of that as our our subjective sense that it feels like it thinks things are or slowly um, but at the same time your brain is unconsciously and that's what we'll call the neural time continuously and always processing time and creating so for example if we're having a conversation and I all of a sudden 
stop speaking, you will be aware of that stop, of that pause, because you were unconsciously predicting that I was about to say something. I didn't. The pause was a bit longer. Then you said, oh, Dean stopped. Did he forget what he was going to say? Did, the, did, the, did, the, did, the, our, did we lose our connection? And so forth. So your brain is continuously processing time unconsciously. Then at certain points, it creates a feeling of the passage of time. So those things are connected, but they're also independent of each other. Um, so yeah, your brain is, con is, is this incredibly complex dynamical system that's always processing time, neural time. Um, you might be moving, you might be moving your eyes, you might be walking. So your brain is doing all these complicated tasks in time that can be sometimes independent of our subjective feeling of the passage of time. So there's two distinct but interrelated aspects to that. Mm -hmm. uh, how detailed is our understanding of how the brain encodes time? I mean, do we have a good understanding of how it encodes time in patterns of neural activity, for example? So, as we've mentioned, the brain tells time across very different time scales. Mm. And each one of those scales has different neural mechanisms. So the circadian okay. clock has these DNA, RNA, protein loops to tell time. And that we actually understand fairly well. But the time on the time scale of that we're using for speech or for predicting when the red light, when we're driving changes or playing music, that we don't understand as well. But to the best of our understanding, that timing on the scale of seconds relies in large part on patterns of neural activity. Okay, so what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So neurons are these computational devices that can um, be inactive, or they can be, and we can say they're not firing or they're spiking, they have activity. Okay. And one neuron can activate another neuron, which can activate another neuron. So you can create these patterns of activity, these spatial temporal patterns of activity. And there's evidence that that's one of the ways the brain tells time on the order of seconds. So when you have to play a piece of music and you have to get the timing correct, um, the idea is, the concept is, is that some neurons start activating, start firing, and those neurons activate other neurons and activate other neurons. And you have this flow of neural activity that seems to be one of the ways the brain is encoding and processing time. Mm -hmm. uh, but are there specific regions of the brain that are specialized in time processing? Yeah, so this is a, a good question that people often ask. Is there some central clock in your brain? And if we think about something like memory, so for the beginning of psychology and the beginning of neuroscience, people asked, where is memory stored? And we do know that there's some um, neurological disorders in which people lose the ability to form new memories. And those are the famous cases like HM and temporal lobe amnesia, where people can't form new memories. So people ask, well, is there something like time is there some area of the brain that's specific for timing, mm -hmm. just like there might be for, for memory? Um, and the answer is probably not. So, and that in a way makes sense because time is so important for everything the brain does, and it does it has different mechanisms on different time scales that there's, to the best of our knowledge, nobody has ever suffered a stroke or had a brain lesion in which they totally lost the ability to both tell the time of day and tell the time of music and not be able to move correctly or catch a ball. So there's cases in which people have lost any one of those abilities, but all types of timing, it seems to be highly distributed in the brain which makes sense because there's many, many different parts, different neural circuits involved in um, timing at different scales. Now, that doesn't mean that some brain areas are more important for the others than others. So we know, for example, that 
one of the areas most implicated in timing for movement and expectation. So maybe when you think the yellow light when you're driving is about to change or the red light um, is about to change, there's pretty good evidence that there's areas um, in subcortical areas. So this is below the cortex and these are areas called the basal ganglia or more specifically the striatum. So these are areas in the brain that are relatively old evolutionarily and seem to be among the most important areas involved in timing on the scale of seconds. Um, but again, we don't fully understand if that is the only area or are there many other areas involved in timing simultaneously. And it seems to be that there are many areas involved simultaneously. So it's not just one area, even on the time scale of seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, does time processing interact in any way with uh, the sensory systems, like, for example, the visual system, the auditory system, or the others? Sure. So you can tell, I like the example of Morse code, right? So Morse code is early temporal. So we reduce speech to a purely single channel temporal code, whether it's dash, dash, dot, dot, has different meanings. And you can do that in different modalities. So you can do that in the auditory modality, which by the way is better and quicker than, but you can also do it in the visual modality with the length of the flashes of light. Um, so each sensory modality can tell time uh, in a manner of speaking, but they also absolutely, they do interact with each other. Um, in some ways that's sort of a simple interaction in which if you're judging the duration of an auditory stimulus, and you get a large visual stimulus, that can change your perception of the auditory stimulus. So these sort of these multimodal interactions um, that reflect that the brain is, is highly connected, right? So about the brain as a computational device is that it has a lot of modules, but all these modules are very interconnected with each other and, and, and always influencing each other. So this is probably one of the reasons why it's so hard for us to think of one thing independently of all the others. So our emotional state, our, um, whether we're hungry or, or happy, that can influence our decisions because everything's connected. So it's certainly the case that at the level of timing, there's, um, sensory multimodal interactions as well. Mm -hmm. But I mean, these interactions, can they run both ways? That is, timing can influence how our senses process certain types of information, but can it also occur the other way around? That is, sensory inputs can influence our perception of time or not? Yes. So, um, in one direction, so if I play you a one second tone, just a piano piece, um, if that's louder, um, sometimes you might be, you may make a judgment that that's, if it's just higher volume, that that's longer. Um, if it was so, so yes, so just the amplitude. Now the other way around, I think if something um, lasts longer, you might influence the other way around as well in terms of you think that it's louder. So there's a lot, yes, these are, and, and certainly the more you practice, you can overcome this, but for most of us, um, yes, you'll definitely get interaction, say between if something is very bright, you might think it lasted longer than if it's not very bright. So yeah, there are interactions. Mm -hmm. So earlier we talked a little bit about memory, for example, are there other aspects of cognition that timing also interacts with? So, yes. And again, we, we should be careful to say, well, timing on the scale of seconds or timing our, our sense of time on or our representation of time. So as we've talked about, humans are unique in our ability to um, engage in mental time travel and to think about the future. So we have to have sort of this symbolic representation of, of when things happened. And, and in our memories, we can keep, we have a memory of order. So 
might remember the last time you went to the movies and the last time you went to dinner and then you can figure out which came first. Mm -hmm. So I have to store um, and that certainly interacts with memory. So one of the things memory does is store some sort of timestamp here that gives us an ability to determine on this long scale what happened first and what happened later but it's important to realize that we're not really very good at that so memory sometimes we do confuse the order of things so if i ask you what happened first was it this is this is probably a bit too um old for you but whether the fukushima tsunami earthquake happened before or after um, the Americans captured um, uh, Osama bin Laden. So those are two big political events or two big worldwide events. And you might remember both of them. Mm -hmm. um, but knowing the order is actually a pretty hard task for most people there. Um, so yes, while we can store this information, we're not as good as we think we are in storing about um, the order of events in memory. But on the short time scale, of course, we're much better. Mm -hmm. And what about interval? That's something we haven't touched on yet. Are we good with dealing with uh, the interval between things, not, not the order, but how long uh, it took for, I mean, the time between two things, two events, yeah. for example? Yeah. So. I think in many ways, the mechanisms underlying duration are probably fairly related to the mechanisms underlying interval in that you have to, to time the onset when the first event happened or the duration started and when that duration ended or the next event. And on the short time scale, we're always continuously measuring interval. And, and I'll give you examples in language. Um, in English, the example is something like they gave her cat food or they gave her cat food. So hope I don't know if you can understand the two words yes. between that, um, but you're always paying attention to the interval between the words and the interval helps you dis distinguish the meaning. And in Portuguese, where we say, at least in Brazilian Portuguese, uma mão or uma mão. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that works in, in, in Portuguese. You uh, can tell me. Yes, it works. Yeah. But you're using the temporal structure to your, the, the interval between the words to infer the meaning. So, yes, on this short time scale of seconds and subseconds, we're continuously telling interval as well as duration. And those are probably pretty similar mechanisms. Now, on this longer time scale, so if I ask you what you did yesterday and you tell me you got up for breakfast, then you went out shopping and then you went to um, a bookstore, you know the order, but you probably don't know the interval that well. You don't know I was in, I had breakfast, took me 15 minutes and then I was driving for 12 minutes. So you don't have a good memory of the interval at that longer time scale. Um, so, so there is a big difference in our ability to store intervals uh, on short and long time scales. Mm -hmm. uh, is timing an intrinsic property of neural networks? So <clears throat> dynamic certainly is. So most physical systems, whether it's neural networks or the planets revolving around each other, or a skier going skiing down a mountain, those are taking place in time. They're dynamical systems. They're governed by the laws of physics and equations um, that are fairly well understood. So they're certainly happening in time. Now, if they're reproducible and consistent, then we can use them to tell time. So what we have argued is that because the brain is an incredibly complex dynamical system um, and that needs to process information that the brain throughout evolution eventually figured out how to use its dynamics to tell time. 
So maybe very early on in the early animals in which um, jellyfish and um, mollusks during evolution, the, they didn't use the dynamics to tell time. But over the course of evolution, the brain had this neural dynamics and it started using its neural dynamics to tell time in the manner that we've uh, touched upon in which patterns of neural activity can be used to encode the passage of time and underlie our ability to speak or play music and and interact with each other. Mm -hmm. So is there a relationship between um, neural time and physical time, that is time in neuroscience versus time in physics? Yeah, so this is a, a profound and um, fun question. And again, here we have to be cautious in how we want to define time. So I like your use of neural time. So we can call that brain time or in some contexts, subjective time. Then what we, we can have what we call time or objective time. And there we just say time is what clocks tell. And that's sort of circular, right? But it's still very useful <laughs> because it's telling us that what a clock is, is a physical device is in some predictable or consistent manner. So a clock is really just a physical device. Not any, um, it's not really measuring time. It's changing in a way that we use to infer the passage of time. Um, and then finally, in physics, so physics is in most scientific fields are really mostly talking about objective time. But in physics, there's something else which is sort of what we might call natural time or the nature of time. Mm -hmm. And there the questions are of the sort of time, a full dimension like space. So we know that space is a three dimensional feature of the universe. Mm -hmm. And then under one view called eternalism or the block universe, the idea is, is that time is a full-blown dimension, almost like a, quote, physical dimension, although the terminology there is a bit difficult, um, in which the past, present, and future all coexist, if you will. They're all equally real. So in that sense, the universe would be a four-dimensional block, if you will. So the past, present, future are already laid out, in a manner of speaking. Now, another view is called presentism, in which only the present is real. So mm -hmm. the past was real, the f present is is real, that's where I exist, and the future um, will at some point um, become real. Now we know that the pres there's no such thing as the absolute present. If you're in a on another planet or in a rocket ship, it doesn't ask make much sense for me to ask Right now, I uh, it's 11 o'clock. I wonder what time it is right now for uh, Ricardo, because there's no absolute present. So, the, so under present, so we know physically that the present is not absolute. It's sort of just a local property. Your present is different from my present. It, in your case, in our case, you and me, where where we have the same reference frame. But if one of us was traveling at um, high speech of what, what time is it um, for Ricardo um, uh, right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's the debate. Does neuroscience offer something to resolve that debate? Um, I've argued that it does. And the reason I've argued that it does is because in physics, the interpretation that we might be in that we that eternalism is correct or that the block universe is correct that is just an interpretation mm -hmm. it hasn't been tested or there's no direct experimental or empirical evidence that we do live in that a uh, universe that's a four dimensional block and indeed it's 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 very hard to test anyways um, let me just say the big way to distinguish between presentism and eternalism is time travel um, 
under eternalism, time travel is a theoretical possibility because you can go to a different moment in time if it exists. But under presentism, um, no, you can't go to the past if the past no longer exists. I can't go to my past because it no longer exists. So time travel is totally out of the question. So what can neuroscience tell us about that? And I, I don't know. I think people would, dis would uh, many physicists probably disagree with me, but I would argue that the subjective feeling of the passage of time is evolutionarily adaptive. We evolved subjective experiences because it helped us survive. Right. If it helps us survive, it's because it's probably part of or correlated with the external reality. So the brain evolved to survive in a world governed by the laws of physics. And that's pretty stringent test, right? The brain needs to understand <clears throat> gravity and physical interactions and in order to survive in this world. And time is part of those physical interactions or part of the property. So I would argue that our sense of the passage of time, that the past is fundamentally different from the present, which is fundamentally different from the future, evolved because it does reflect a property of the external world that is presentism as opposed to eternalism. So in that sense, I mean, would this be sort of a, let's say, pragma a pragmatic view in the sense that since we evolved uh, processing time and of course uh, that is something adaptive then that should correspond at least to some extent to some something out there in reality right yes that's the argument i'm making so the uh, uh, um, an analogy is color so you and i perceive the color of objects or of animals or of plants and that's very what exists electro the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation right. and the brain evolution evolved a way to detect the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation and create the subjective experience of color so color doesn't quite exist in physics or much less subjective color but our subjective experience of it is very very valuable generally speaking and adaptive because it's correlated with something that's occurring in physics. So my point here is that our subjective experience of the passage of time, while it might be distorted under certain circumstances and might have illusions, the fundamental subjective experience that the past and present and future are different from each other and that time is flowing um, would not have evolved if it wasn't correlated with something that's happening in the external world governed by the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. So I have one last question then. Uh, during the, our conversation, you've used several times the term mental clock, but what does that correspond to exactly, neurologically speaking? I mean, what is this mental clock? You mean mental clock or mental time travel? Uh, so mental, mental clock mental clock. So I think I've used the term, so we have these sort of neural timers or these clocks or timers within our brain. And we have many, many of these uh, timers. So we have one in the circadian clock is one of them, but that's very specific for hours and, and, and days. But the whole brain in many ways, what we have argued is a sense a dynamical system and in a way can tell time on a case-by-case -case basis. So your visual cortex and your auditory cortex are processing auditory and visual stimuli. If the task you're doing is requires timing, maybe it's a Morse code task, then that is a neural clock or a neural timer. So I don't, in, in my view, in many ways, the whole brain is a temporal process is one of its main functions is to allow us to predict and prepare for the future, um, tell time, experience time, 
and allow us to engage in mental time travel. So I would say the brain in many ways is a clock. And that was the title of the book. And it was a bit um, in jest or exaggerating a bit. But your brain is a time machine in that not that it's allowing us to travel in time, but it's processing time, conceptualizing time, representing time, and allowing us to engage in uh, mental time travel. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, Dr. Buonomano, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find your work on the internet? Well, um, just my book, um, the Your Brain is a Time Machine, the, the I'm sorry, let me say that again, Ricardo. So, so just my book, Your Brain is a Time Machine, The Neuroscience and Physics of Time is available on a lot of, uh, is av available online. So um, that's a good introduction to these, what we've been talking about today. Great, so I will be leaving a link to it in the description box of this interview. And thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Muito obrigado, Ricardo. <laughs>